Right. So far, we haven't seen too much pushback on Haidt's intuitionist approach to moral psychology. Uh, so this article argues for a greater role from reasoning in moral judgment. At this point, you should be familiar with the debate between the rationalists or the sentimentalists slash intuitionists. Uh, the question is, you know, is moral judgment the product of reason or emotion? And it's something that matters, right? So not only, you know, we do want to know the correct theory of the mind and the correct theory of moral judgment, uh, but there are also practical applications. Uh, we would like to be able to convince other people of our moral judgments, and it would be helpful to know if we should be appealing to their reason or to their emotions, right? Haidt has argued that it's primar you primarily want to um, appeal to their intuition, right? and that's going to be more effective. Um, is that really the case? Uh, maybe we want to improve our own morality and our own moral judgments. Similar, we'd like to know, should I be studying logic and getting better reasoning, or should I be getting more in touch with my emotions? Should I go to therapy or something like that instead? So the debate has, you know, uh, has consequences, and it's worth exploring both sides. So, as always, it's helpful to, to try to start with some definitions. Again, you know, uh, there's a limit to how how good definitions can be, right? But it, it'll at least give us an idea of what we're talking about. So Haight uh, used consciousness as a criterion to distinguish the system one and the system two processes, right? System one is conscious, sorry, system two is conscious, system one is largely unconscious and automatic. Um, you can't really use that consciousness criterion for distinguishing between emotion and reason uh, because plenty of emotions are conscious, right? Even if system one thinking is largely unconscious, but yeah, we have conscious emotions all the time. We feel sad, we feel angry, right? We feel afraid. And there's lots of reasoning that is unconscious, right? Um, this has been, you know, known sort of since Freud sort of maybe pioneered it, but then now there's lots of uh, studies where we unconscious natural processes and, and other cognitive processes. Right? Um, so consciousness is not a clear dividing line. Um, you know, one idea is like maybe uh, information processing, right? Is there, does emotion not involve information at all and reasoning is all about information processing? But uh, May and Kumar argue that uh, lots of emotions do involve processing information, right? And uh, I won't go into the detail there, but if you're interested, you can study it more. Um, so th their definition is emotion is inherently valenced. So emotions have a positive or negative feeling attached to them. If you feel anxious that's bad if you feel joyful that's good right and so on and so they define emotion as having this valence right and reason does not right reason again and, and this was sort of hume's claim right reason doesn't say whether something is good or bad um it just right takes out talks about how things are and draws inferences right um and reason is defined by them as an inferential process inference produces new beliefs in your cognitive system from old ones, from existing ones, right? So uh, if I know that, you know, if it rains, then the streets will get wet, and then I see the weather report that it rain, it's raining, I can infer that the streets will get wet, that's an inferential, something like that. Certainly goes in on in our brains, and they're calling that reason. So they do a, a bit of review, right, about, um, you know, these, these studies that we've been looking at, right? How that reasoning is conscious and deliberate, sometimes it's automatic, um, and right, the Josh Green study that we read is one such, uh, uh, one such example, right? So we saw that people who agreed to push, to push the big guy in the trolley problem, it made them, they had to think harder. There was like a little tension there. It wasn't just going off their gut intuitions and so, they were having to do a little more conscious, deliberate reasoning, as opposed to people who said, no, I won't push the big guy. That was pretty much straightforward into it, right, got it. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not reasoning, right? Or so May and Kumar will argue. We've seen that moral reasoning is often post hoc, right? We see people have their gut intuitions, they make the judgment, and then afterwards they make up reasons, right, to support their judgment. Um, as opposed to the other way around, right, where you do careful reasoning and then 
whatever conclusion you draw is what you is is the judgment you make. It doesn't seem to be, according to these other uh, articles we've been reading, the way moral judgments work. But May and Kumar want to argue against this view, right? They think that conscious deliberate reasoning plays a large role in in moral reasoning, um, and that reasoning that intuition is not as dominant as they say, right? Your instinctive reactions can actually be modified by reasoning. Um, one example they offer is uh, implicit bias, training against implicit bias, right? So I don't know if you've ever heard of implicit bias. If you Google it, there's lots of tests you can take, right? To see if you have implicit bias on the basis of race or gender or something like that. They'll show you a bunch of like kind of pictures and ask you to, and, and words and ask you to just pick, you know, uh, to push A and B for the, the instructions differ, right? To test your reaction times, basically to see if you have any sort of bias where you associate, you know, white faces with positive attitudes. Um, so if you take one of those tests and turns out you do have some implicit bias on the basis of race or whatever, um, you know, you can work on that and you can train yourself to get better at that. Uh, so that's a deliberate rational process that is trying to modify your instinctive reactions. And, uh, you know, we have seen a lot of evidence that moral judgments are often unconscious, but just because they're unconscious does not mean that they're not rational, right? Because, again, rationality, reasoning can happen unconsciously. Uh, in fact, if we look at some of the judgments involved that we've already talked about, they're actually fairly complex and sophisticated and inherently do involve a fair amount of reasoning. Recall the, um, right, the mind reading that was involved in a, uh, in the uh, moral dyad theory, right? Figuring out what's going on in someone else's head requires a lot of inferences, right? You're looking at some expression on their face. You have some general principle about when people's faces look like that. That usually means they're angry, except, or unless it's in a different situation, if they're in a play or something, you have a lot of information going on. You're unconsciously sort of figuring out, crunching all those, you know, propositions and coming out with a conclusion. Oh yes, this person is happy, this person, Leaves that I want to turn right, this person wants to turn right, um, and so on, right? It's, it's a fairly complex inferential process, my view. Um, and, you know, judging intentions is an, import, is an important part of moral judgment, right? Uh, and it seems to happen automatically, right? So if you manipulate, right, you know, you give somebody a scenario and you manipulate how intentional the action was or not, you know, did the, you describe it as somebody kicking a puppy on purpose or accidentally tripping and kicking a puppy, and people will tend to judge it as worse, more immoral if it's intentional. But if you ask them why they said that was so bad or so immoral, they won't actually report that it was intentional, right? So you, by manipulating the, the variable, you, you can kind of figure out why they judged it the way they did, but they will report something else, right? Um, so that means that, you know, there was reasoning going on there, right? They were figuring out people's intentions, and yet, um, it was unconscious access to the reasoning that they were doing, right? but it was reasoning nonetheless. Uh, other studies show unconscious effects of factors like um, action versus emission, right? So, you know, is it you can harm somebody by doing something to them or you can harm somebody by not doing anything to save them, right? Action versus emission, you know, contact versus at a distance. That's like the trolley problem of pushing somebody or just pulling a lever and so on. Um, all these distinctions, people will, you know, regularly make, it will change their moral judgments. They're obviously picking up on these differences, right? But picking up on those differences is a pretty sophisticated, rational thing, right? To, to be able to tell the difference between an action and an omission requires some reasoning, right? Um, so it seems to be happening unconscious. They don't always report it, but it must be reasoning because it's a complicated thing, right? Um, and, you know, this is not so implausible. The very complicated reasoning could be going on at a subconscious level. Uh, language must operate that way, right? Understanding a language. If you've ever, you know, as an adult, tried to learn English or learn Mandarin or something, it's incredibly difficult, right? But once you're fluent, it's you, all this really complicated stuff unconsciously. So your, your brain is perfectly capable of doing really complex things at a subconscious level. So 
point of all that being reason is uh, must be involved in moral judgment a lot of reasoning involved um, so what to what degree is emotion involved right the sentimentalists or intuitionists um, particularly well, the hume style sentimentalists have said reason alone is not sufficient for morality right um, reason about what consequences an action in, would have but the sentimentalists say to decide that that consequence is bad I need something else. I need some emotional reaction to that consequence, be it empathy or something like something else, right? Um, and we have seen this evidence that certain emotional deficiencies due to psychopathy uh, or brain damage do correlate with. Emotion. So we have correlations between emotion and, and morality, right? But the fact remains, right? Most people with these kinds of brain damage do not become serial killers. Like that is actually very rare, and there are you know, functioning psychopaths out there that, um, right, do not commit immoral acts, right? They, and they're doing that, presumably just on the basis of reason, right? Because by hypothesis, they're emotional damage, right? But they're still managing to go out there and be moral human beings just on the basis of, of reasoning, right? Um, that actually seems to maybe support rationalism, right? Um, you don't need emotions to still be a moral person. The vast majority of people with emotional damage are moral people, right? Um, you know, you might say, sure, emotion adds some sort of color to morality. It adds something, right? But it's not the core, right? And certainly, you know, the tradition of Ralph Kant, you know, being one, right? But yeah, it's, reason is the basis of morality, right? So that still seems to like a live option, according to, to me all this evidence that hate has, has shown us, right? So hate has claimed that, that some studies can only be explained if emotion is doing the work in a moral uh, When confronted with harmless but emotionally evocative scenarios, people's judgments still don't change, right? So this is, you know, the incest scenarios, eating a roadkill or eating your dead pet, that stuff. Um, this stuff is emotionally charged and it makes a moral judgment. And even then, when he, he can explain all day long that it doesn't cause any harm and that doesn't change your judgment, right? And then this seems to be supported by neural evidence that shows that in these situations, areas of the brain associated with emotion. So May and Kumar, they admit, yeah, there are such, there do seem to be such correlations, um, but that doesn't really, again, correlation, correlation is not causation, right? It, the causal uh, arrow could be the other way around, right? So there could be unconscious, rational uh, processes going on that then cause you to have an emotional reaction, right? Um, I did, if I do a little math and deduce that I'm going to be broke within six months, I may well have an emotional reaction, right? Reason can cause emotions. Um, correlation alone doesn't really decide it, so they claim. <clears throat> now you. You can just directly manipulate people's emotions and see if that makes a significant different significant moral judgment. So you can decide, right? Um, the way we figure out whether whether something's a causal factor is, you know, in a manipulate that factor, right? And don't just look for correlations, but look for you know, if we manipulate this. Um, and this is done, right? Um, it's been done with disgust. It's pretty easy to make people feel. All you have to do is make the environment around the messy or, you know, pump a nasty smell into the uh, environment. And, and there are studies that claim, right, that activating disgust increases the severity of people's moral judgments. But May and Kumar, in, in, in reviewing that literature, they find that they do find statistical effects, but they find that they're fairly weak. Um, they tend to be kind of inconsistent and often not replicable. You know, a good study, you'd like to have a nice strong effect, right, statistically, and you'd like to, some other researchers and some other lab on the other part of the world want to run the same study, you're going to hope they get the results, and that's uh, the case with these studies that purport to show an ef a causal effect of emotional or moral judgment. All right, so, <clears throat> so far, right, is convincing to you, right? Then now you may be not quite sure, right? Is is moral judgment primarily rational or is it primarily emotional? 
Um, is it possible that it's kind of both, right? A very complex interaction of both? Um, maybe, right? So motivated reasoning exists, right? So certainly is sometimes the case that our reasoning is driven by something other than just pure logic and rationality, right? So if we want something bad enough, we'll come up with reasons to why we should have it. Um, you know, if you don't want to believe that the candidate that you're supporting and whatever is a criminal, you'll come up with some reasons to excuse suspicious behavior. And, you know, we do motivated reasoning all the time. Um, but there's, you know, <clears throat> plenty of other motivations for reasoning too. You, you can be motivated just to reason accurately, right? Or to reason consistently with the other beliefs. Um, you could be motivated, yeah, to avoid feeling bad. So <clears throat> the point being, yes, it is certainly possible for emotions to drive moral judgments, but lots of things drive, lots of things drive moral judgments. The desire to be rational can drive your moral judgments as well. So, or another example of motivated reasoning is selfishness. That isn't a primarily emotional thing, right? Selfishness is self-interest, right? Um, and that certainly drives a lot of our reasoning, but that's not emotional. The point being, sure, emotion can drive reason, but And the converse is true. Reasoning definitely affects emotion as well. So we've seen, uh, they described earlier evidence that people can reason their way into correcting implicit biases, right? Um, and if it turns out that implicit bias, biases are emotion driven, uh, then that's one case of reason affecting emotion. Uh, so it's sort of an example, lots of sort of like, into lots of intuitions, right? And emo may potentially emotionally driven intuitions can be trained by reason. Right? Any skill is going to start with careful, conscious, rational attention, driving a car, right? Riding a bike. Somebody tells you all the rules and you kind of run the rules through your head and try to follow them. Um, but eventually, once you learn the skill, now it's like a non rational sort of motor response thing, an intuitive thing. So Reason can definitely drive your intuitions, right? We do it all the time. Anytime we learn a skill, and um, you can also uh, train your moral intuition. Some people are vegetarians, and they came to be vegetarians by being convinced. Maybe they took an ethics class and they heard the evidence for vegetarianism, right? That it's immoral uh, to eat meat. And if you know any vegetarians, at a certain point, right, they they also become sort of disgusted by the idea of meat. So it's certainly the case that at least for some vegetarians, it was a rational decision first, and eventually they developed an instinctive, right, instinctive emotional reaction. Um, that also seems to be the case just with smoking these days, right? Now, fewer people smoke these days. Most people are convinced that it's a bad idea for your health, right? And they also seem to be more disgusted by it than they were in the 40s. So again, it's all this knowledge, this rational knowledge about how bad smoking is for you, seems to drop the disgust that people feel for it. Another example of this complex sort of reciprocal relation between reason and emotion, moral judgments, it comes from uh, what John Rawls, who was a, a political philosopher, he called it reflective equilibrium. This is a method that we often that he sort of proposed for evaluating philosophical theories, uh, which is you begin with reasoning, right? So uh, you have arguments that say, you know, why, for example, you know, utilitarianism, which is the view that good and bad are just all about, you know, how much harm, how much pain and pleasure is caused to people. So something that causes the most pleasure for the most people, that's good. Something that causes more pain than pleasure for the most people, that's bad. Moral theory, sounds reasonable um but then what we do right is we test out the results against that, against our intuitions so utilitarianism sounds um reasonable but then if you sort of draw out the consequences a little bit it seems to entail that you know if you save two lives by killing your own mother um then you should do that it would maximize pleasure you know two people get to live rather than one but that's going to feel weird right that's going to uh not seem very intuitive 
And Rawls says, okay, you know, if we have that sort of gut reaction, then we go back and we reevaluate the theory. Maybe we tweak it a bit so that it, right, so that it doesn't this uh, strike us in our gut. Rawls maybe so that it doesn't have that same consequence. And creating theories is this sort of feedback, right? And so, you know, if you buy that that that's to test a theory, that may be also what humans are doing in their And, you know, hates scenarios, right? Maybe an example of this sort of interplay. Or the incest scenario, whatever, they have a gut feeling that this is discussed, this is wrong, right? Um, maybe the feeling emotion involved is, nope, that's wrong. Then you ask them, well, why is it wrong? They struggle to find the reasons. Some people might, a few people may just change their mind, right? In the majority of the cases, the emotion wins out. Um, but they do have to come up with new reasons why their emotions. And so it is still a cyclical process, right? And you could see that maybe eventually um, that cycle is maybe what could lead them to a different judgment possibly. Right? So <clears throat> hopefully this was not too painfully long, right? But I did want to, um, I didn't want you to think that the class is just sort of a, uh, uh, just on hate side, right? Through the whole thing and there's no sort of, at all. There's certainly um, uh, good reasons to think that he's be right about everything, right? And so I think May and Kumar's article was a good uh, summary of, of, of those points. So now you have sort of both sides. If you're writing a paper, you can use those.